Let's skip ahead to the pivotal moment, which uh, I think is uh, uh, obligatory to touch on in any account of the Earl Grey players. That is to say, the, uh, the, the day when your father and your mother uh, were taking a walk through uh, the uh, area that was developing into the University of Toronto mm. and found themselves on the grounds of Trinity College and uh, your father was struck by the inspiration uh, that this would be uh, the perfect site for a production of Twelfth Night. Do you have a personal re recollection of, uh, of that? Uh, not of that walk because I wasn't there, but, but um, I, I certainly remember uh, discussions at, at the, in the house about uh, how, how marvelous that setting was. Mm -hmm. I think a reference was made to Regent's Park, which you know is um, um, the site of open air theater in London. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think my parents had actually acted in Regent's Park. They were certainly aware of it and they mentioned it as, as being a paradigm. And that this would be um, an excellent um, um, location for, for Shakespeare's plays. And, uh, and so they put on Twelfth Night, which was their first one. Now, were you involved in any of, the, uh, of these early performances? Yeah, I was very young. Um, so um, um, I, I can't remember how, you know, well, I remember the first part that I ever played was Curio in, in, uh, in Twelfth, Night, Twelfth Night, where I'd interrupt uh, the Duke and, and, and say, shall we go hunt, <laughs> my lord? <laughs> that, that was my one line. <laughs> but I, 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 that wouldn't have been in the first production. I, I was too young for that. Okay. Uh, that came later, a little bit later. I, but I was still pretty young, maybe 16, 17 or something. All right. How uh, do you recall, or what do you recall, of the reception of those early performances? The the um, the first couple, I think it was three performances in 1946. Uh, yeah. In the quadrangle at uh, Trinity College, yeah. the three-sided quadrangle of Trinity College. Yeah. At that time. Yeah. Uh, and the um, uh, the remount in September of that year. It's possible. I don't remember the precise um, and time. And then, yeah. uh, and then, if I remember correctly, it was um, Taming of the Shrew. Mm -hmm. In 1947. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you recall of the early reception of those shows? Well, it was r remarkably positive. Uh, I think it surprised my parents um, because they would talk about it and how uh, how favorable um, the audience reaction was. They, I mean, the size of the audience is they were quite large. I mean, several hundred. Really? People, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, there were nights where it could be 500 plus people, uh, um, and they got that later on as well. But but at the beginning, the the audience was quite big mm -hmm. in terms of what that quadrangle could hold, and uh, they um, they were very encouraged by by that reaction. What uh, was the demographic that uh, um, that? constituted that audience was it uh, was it members of the sort of British uh, British community uh, well or did it seem to I be mean there were largely arty people that, mm -hmm. that would have been the core I suppose uh, people interested in the arts uh, um, and theater people in general uh, well theater people or or people that might be interested in art galleries or anything to do with the art didn't have to be necessarily drama it could mm -hmm. be broader than that music for instance uh, uh, that was a tendency and I, I think um, uh, a few people from upper middle class would would find it interesting to go there. Anybody that um, might have traveled uh, would would come. Mm -hmm. And um, I think you mentioned in your your work that there seemed to be a predominance of women there. I'd, um, well, I think uh, I, I think that, that, that may have happened, uh, but but quite naturally because uh, because I think. Uh, it, certainly in those days, um, uh, women tended to be more interested in the arts than men mm -hmm. did. So uh, if you were to provide an artistic experience for them, uh, for people, the tendency would be for more women to come. It, uh, our parents never set out to, uh, to be attractive to women as opposed to men. They, okay. they, had, they would have been probably surprised even to find out that the demographic worked out that way. Because it was certainly not their intention. They didn't orient anything, and there was never any discussion about that. Uh, but I know from just observation that, uh, uh, that uh, artistic performances seem to appeal to women a bit more. Now, uh, at the time, there were uh, uh, several uh, different attempts to stimulate a Canadian 
theater. In fact, there was a um, uh, there was a movement that started, I think, uh, at the Arts and Letters Club with mm -hmm. um, a uh, a solicitation of scripts by a, a committee which included, I think, your father and John Coulter. Mm -hmm. There was the New Play Society. Um, later on, there was the Crest Theater. There were the Straw Hat Players. Mm -hmm. um, what was the? Do you, what do you recall of the relationship between um, the uh, uh, the Earl Grey players and these other groups that were forming in an attempt to stimulate a theatrical life in Toronto? I don't think there was a great deal of um, formal association, but um, there's some informal one among mm -hmm. people. For instance, uh, when 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 my parents started. The, the festival, and it should be really borne in mind. This is central to the non, to an understanding of what really went on with that festival. They had no money at all. Yeah. I mean, absolutely not. I mean, um, father, uh, m mother d didn't work um, to earn money, and um, he did. <coughs> he he made um, um, a very modest living out of uh, writing radio scripts and sometimes acting on the radio, but that was very, very little money. We, we had almost nothing, and yet he was able to, to mount these plays. How did he do it? Well, he did it through persuasion. Uh, in, initially, um, all the players, many of them may have been professional, but they would come and uh, be persuaded my, by my father to act in the first plays for nothing. They, did, they weren't paid. Uh, some were true amateurs, but others were just not paid, but professional. Lorne Green is an example mm -hmm. of that. Uh, uh, he, he was, that's my father, was able to persuade members of the theatrical community to join him in this um, escapade of, of producing Shakespeare in the, in the quadrangle. And that's really what got it all kicked off. Ultimately, uh, when the audiences uh, uh, were large enough, he, he was able to charge money, and there was a surplus. He was then able gradually to, to offer money to, to the players, and it changed uh, from, um, from a uh, non-remunerative enterprise to a remunerative one. And, and towards the end, they were paid pretty well a, a living wage, but there was an evolution there. Um, and that, that sometimes uh, has been not well understood by the commentators. Uh, at first they, I mean, I've, I've seen people say, well, it was an amateur um, uh, uh, playing group uh, that ultimately did uh, uh, turn into a professional one. That's not correct. Um, they were just not paid. but. They did consist largely of professional actors. Of course, my parents were professional as well. Mm -hmm. I suppose that the success that your father had in persuading professionals to come and work uh, for mm. free at first um, is uh, in large part a testament to the amount of credibility that he had um, uh, as a, an exponent of the classical yeah. style. Yeah. Um, if I recall correctly, I think it was um, in order to get experience with that style that people like Lauren Green, uh, a young William Hutt, um, yeah. uh, first... Yeah, because they had no background in Shakespeare. None of these actors did. Mm -hmm. Lauren Green was an announcer. He had a wonderful voice, a mellifluous, deep voice, uh, and a natural... Uh, theatrical ability, but he wasn't a real actor. Um, William Hutt was very young at the at the time and had no back. Probably never seen a Shakespeare play. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt that my father uh, was really the only one in Toronto who truly understood Shakespeare, and this was attractive to these people. Do you suppose that um, that reputation had a negative aspect? Well, yeah, the, the negative aspect plays out in this tension that I was talking about mm -hmm. before. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, he was, it could, could be seen by, by some as being rather haughty and looking down on, on the colonials um, here. and um, They're ignorant, they don't know anything, and, and he's going to uh, show them the light. Uh, mm -hmm. I, think that's, I think that was the case uh, that people felt this way, but I think was unjustified mm -hmm. be because he was not that type. He was a very modest man. He wasn't haughty and certainly not arrogant. Uh, and he was very sensitive to the sensitivities of Canadians. I know that for, because he would often talk about that at home. So would my mother. 
Uh, my mother had a different personality. She was much more aggressive than, than uh, my uh, father and what did way? have a tendency to put people off. Okay. In what way? I mean, she would have put people off in England, let alone in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, because uh, uh, obviously she was a woman of tremendous drive. Um, also, <clears throat> uh, she evidently had uh, a very strong sense of how theater was supposed to function um, and what the, what the job of performing yeah. was. Well, she had a very strong personality um, and uh, she was outgoing. I was an extrovert. Uh, yes, yeah, she did have these strong views, but they were on all fours with my father. There was no disagreement between the two yeah. about how Shakespeare should be done. Um, uh, she was a very good promoter, a natural promoter, and uh, I would think it's no exaggeration to say that, that um, if she were not there, there would have been no Shakespeare Festival. Uh, and if he weren't there, there wouldn't have been. In other words, they were almost symbiotic in, in the creation mm -hmm. of this enterprise. They needed each other. They, they completely complemented each other. She was, she was the business head in the, in the terms of promotion. Right. Um, and he was the artistic one in terms of direction. He was the leader, if you like, mm -hmm. the CEO. Um, uh, she would have been the business development manager, if you like. Uh, uh, she was willing to get out there and persuade people and, and go to all these uh, organizations that you mentioned uh, and uh, persuade them to, to come in and either, uh, well, s support the festival. All the publicity was driven by her. Uh, her father was far too shy to do all of that. He, he wouldn't, wouldn't, have been able, wouldn't have been able to do it. 